morning. It's a pleasure to have you all here this morning. I'm Aaron Mercer. I am the Vice President of Government Relations for the National Religious Broadcasters. And uh, first of all, before we get started here with this great panel event, I was asked by our camera folks to make sure you're to remember your phones, uh, have them on silence. <laughs> Just, so um, one of those things we need to remember in our modern technology world. Uh, so anyways, I want to say good morning. And again, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with NRB, we're an association of Christian communicators uh, that reach millions of listeners and viewers both on the air and online. Our mission is to advance biblical truth, promote media excellence, and defend free speech. Now we've been doing this mission since 1944. And actually, it's interesting that during that World War II generation, uh, in the midst of World War II, the reason why NRB was formed is because evangelical Christian uh, speakers who were, who were on the air, they were encouraging many, many people. They were receiving lots of mail from folks who they were encouraging in that generation. Uh, and yet, the powers that be during that time in the private sector were saying that they didn't want them on the air anymore. And so the NRB was formed to rectify that problem. Well, now we're 70 years later, and NRB is uh, confronting a new wave of private censorship, uh, or at least concerns about private censorship. In the new media, in the new media uh, technology, there have been numerous in instances where uh, there's been view viewpoint discrimination, whether it's on Facebook, Google, and other examples that Craig Harshall will be getting into in more detail, as well as uh, a number of our panelists. We'll have uh, Governor Huckabee will be giving us a, a short uh, description of his experience with Facebook last summer. Uh, and I believe some of our panelists can also give their testimony on this situation also. Uh, but I just wanted to briefly let you know, why is this called John Milton Project in the first place? Well, John Milton was uh, he, he was in the 1800s, and many know him as the author of Paradise Lost, but he also uh, had a lot to say in the era, area of politics. Uh, and uh, one of his major themes was that there should be free speech in England. Uh, the printing presses should not be shut down in England. They should be able to, uh, all ideas should go on the printing press, and the, great, the best ideas will come to the top. And that's the, that's the idea that we're putting forward in the John Milton Project. Again, I'll let Craig, Par Craig Parshall go into more detail on this. Uh, but that's just a brief introduction of who NRB is. And uh, let me turn it over to Craig. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Um, this is really a kind of pioneering venture because uh, as many of you have noticed, if you followed media technology issues, uh, free internet, open internet issues, and freedom of speech on web, platforms, that a lot of the conversation has been historically, uh, and with good reason, um, threats to internet freedom by governments, particularly those overseas, against user freedom on the internet. And obviously the Arab Spring has brought this to bear. In fact, Twitter and Facebook have, and I think to a large degree, have deserved some credit in terms of stimulating democratic impulses in countries that really have not known democratic rule. But we're not here today really to talk about government suppression of ideas on new media platforms, uh, although that is one of our concerns. But the primary concern uh, of the John Milton Project is the modern day printing press, the internet, and those various fantastic innovations and media platforms that we all use, like the iPad, and I'm one of them, uh, and the power of those private companies to be the arbiters of truth and opinions and holding the power to either allow or to suppress viewpoints and ideas that they simply do not agree with. Uh, the, uh, the John Milton Project has been around for about three years. And in that three years, we've had a number of activities. We've had roundtables like this. In fact, this is the fourth such Washington, D.C.-based roundtable of a variety of experts. And I've frankly learned a lot because, as I said, this is a pioneering effort. Uh, we're in uncharted territories. Uh, legally, there is really uh, a, a unique question about what rights users have on the private internet platforms of these new media giants. What are the rights of the users? What are the rights of Facebook, Google, and Apple? Uh, and what is really in the public interest in terms of free flow of information? 
So for the last three years, we have been following this issue, and we have seen, with some dismay, uh, the policies and practices of new media companies like Facebook, Apple, and Google, who have uh, more times than we can currently count closed down opinions or viewpoints because they violate their content policies, content policies that we have great trouble with because they're broad, overly broad, vague, and really uh, allowing of censorious uh, uh, policies and practices that shut down opinions that may be simply politically incorrect. Well, about uh, six months after we started the project three years ago, and this was all theoretical. We, we started with the concern only based on the written policies of these companies. Uh, had n really n not seen any American-based acts of censorship. But then, lo and behold, Apple uh, took down Chuck Colson's Manhattan Declaration, which was a pretty traditional statement of Christian orthodoxy in matters of family, relationships, marriage, sanctity of life, religious freedom. Nothing really revolutionary, uh, no bomb throwing threats in that declaration, but it was taken down because its viewpoint was simply politically uh, incorrect. And Eric Tietzel, by the way, is with us today, one of our panelists, and he could talk about that in a little bit more detail. But it wasn't just Apple, uh, they followed, uh, following that was uh, instances of censorship by Google and Facebook they had their own share of free speech takedowns on their own sites. And then, of course, there was the famous or infamous incident uh, not too long ago where Governor, uh, Governor Mike Huckabee, who had his own Facebook page and quite a sizable American following, as you can imagine, took a stand in the Chick-fil-A debate about uh, same-sex marriage. And, of course, the founder of Chick-fil-A came out publicly saying he believes in traditional marriage, not same-sex marriage. And so Governor Huckabee uh, decided to opine on his Facebook page. And uh, well, I'm going to let Governor Mike Huckabee fill in the rest. He wanted to be with us today, but he had a prior speaking engagement in North Carolina. But through the magic of technology, we have his videotape message. So without further ado, Governor Mike Huckabee. Hello, I'm Mike Huckabee, and I'm delighted to be here to talk about an issue that I think is near and dear to the heart of a lot of Christians, and hopefully uh, will help you understand something of the John Milton Project. About a year ago, when we did the uh, Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day, uh, we put a, an event site on Facebook. Shouldn't be any problem. I mean, it's uh, telling people to go get a chicken sandwich. Nothing controversial. Nobody's to yell, nobody's to scream, no signs, no protest. Go eat a chicken sandwich. Well, the thing took off, and it was just uh, uh, amazing to all of us. But even more amazing was that Facebook took our page down, and we couldn't figure out why. And for a number of hours, we couldn't get any answer from Facebook. And finally, uh, after we've ginned up an enormous level of protest, uh, Facebook, who finally admitted that they thought that the content was offensive and unsafe, uh, agreed that there was nothing unsafe or offensive about asking people just to stand with Chick-fil-A in appreciation by going to buy a chicken sandwich. But it reminded us of something, and that is that the culture war in which we're in today uh, is intense, and we're not on the prevailing side of public opinion when it comes to media organizations like Facebook and and other entities, and I think we have to come to the conclusion that censorship is alive and well in America today if you're Christian. Now, if, uh, if you want to say uh, maybe something that is vulgar, you'd be amazed how protected you are. If you want to say something that is offensive to Christians, you can call Christians anything. That's not a problem. But if Christians want to take a stand for traditional marriage or for the sanctity of life, you better be prepared to have to fight for it. Uh, my friend Kirk Cameron had a similar experience in promoting the movie Unstoppable, and Facebook took their page down for a while. Uh, so this is not isolated. It's not something that is just occasionally happening. And I would also say it's not accidental. This was intentional. And the only way that we were able to get the Chick-fil-A page back up was to register an enormous complaint, take it to the public square of the general media, and 
virtually shamed them into realizing that the double standard and the duplicity with which they were operating was absolutely um, uh, indefensible. So I'm grateful that there is a concerted effort to try to not only make Christian believers and organizations aware of what we're up against, but uh, to not be weary in well-doing. Take a stand, uh, be kind, be gracious, but be firm. We're Americans too. And somehow being Christian does not mean that we gave up any of the basic rights that every American should have, regardless of what his or her particular uh, spiritual persuasion uh, should be. Well, Governor Huckabee uh, emphasized, and rightly so, that uh, a great deal of uh, the censorship that has taken place, and I use the word censorship not in the technical legal sense, because censorship only uh, occurs when a government suppresses ideas rather than private companies, but I use it in a, in a broader, more cultural sense uh, of shutting down ideas that one doesn't like. Uh, Governor Huckabee was emphasizing the anti-Christian aspect of this, but really it's, it's gotten much broader uh, than just religious controversy or moral issues. Um, as a matter of fact, there was an incident that happened just this last weekend, again on Facebook, and I think it points out that this censorious attitude uh, of suppressing ideas that may not be politically correct is now expanding into pure political speech, much of it conservative or libertarian, uh, which Facebook simply does not like. And here's the story that broke over the weekend. Thousands of truckers around America are planning to drive into Washington, D.C. to protest the policies of the Obama administration October 11th through October 13th of this year. That's coming up. They join forces with another conservative uh, group that is hanging some banners from overpasses around the country, also protesting uh, the policies of President uh, Obama. So they're gonna come into town, they're gonna let their voices be known. Now, like any savvy organization or movement today, if they wanna get the word out, where do you go? You go to f Facebook, the number one social networking site in the universe. And so they uh, created their Facebook page. Suddenly they had 86,000 followers on Facebook. Things were rolling. But then something happened, September 22nd, Facebook took down the page, took down the page citing its so-called community guidelines about content that they would not permit. Now the Facebook policies that Facebook uses to decide which opinions can be shared and which ones aren't, we have examined. And as I said, they allow too much abuse, too much discretion in the hands of those who either negligently or willfully are taking down ideas that more often than not, more, not always, but more often than not, tend to be of the conservative political nature. Now, the John Milton Project, as I said, has been following this for several years, and we like to bring experts like we have on this panel, not because they agree with us. See, we do something a little bit different. We like to bring people who may disagree or who may have some ideas that we haven't entertained. As I said, this is a frontier policy issue, but it's too important to ignore. In my humble opinion, it is probably one of the most important free speech issues of the 21st century, as every aspect of media and information and data transmission is all migrating to the internet. And who controls the levers of the internet and what power do they have? Now, what, what are the issues as we focus in on, all right, there may be some random instances of, of viewpoint censorship, but is it that big a deal? Well, two factors to consider on why it's that big a deal. Number one is the power and the ubiquity, the, the near monopoly presence and power of these companies over in, uh, information on the internet. Now, let me use an analogy that Steve Jobs used. And this was back in the 80s, so that was way before the wireless uh, breakthrough in terms of wireless devices. And he was doing an interview with a magazine. And he predicted that in the 21st century, uh, computers and, and internet-based and computer-based technology would be to the 21st century what Bell Telephone was to the 20th century. Of course, there's an interesting twist to that because today, AT&T, Comcast, Verizon, whoever your telephone carrier is, could not decide to shut down your church's website or their telephone service because they don't like their statement of faith 
or their beliefs. Now, raises some questions that we'll get into getting down into the weeds here about whether or not it's a good analogy between telephone networks and some of these new media companies, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit more detail. But when you have a monopoly over information and the levers and platforms of, of technology, as if we have one printing press rather than multiple ones in the 1700s like John Milton was addressing, what if we had one, inter uh, one platform, the new printing press, it's called the Internet, and we have a number of private companies that control the levers of the best devices. Does that create a moral, social, or maybe political and even legal obligation for them to respect free speech? Now, let's take a look, for instance, at, uh, at Apple's uh, iPad, which I have, and I'm a lawyer, and I guess lawyers always gravitate to the first thing, stick to it, and get loyal and don't want to muddy their mind with new devices. And so they don't look at Android, perhaps, but surveys have said that 98% of every lawyer in America that uses a tablet uses an Apple product, 98%. Not only that, but Apple controls a large lead, a, a very substantial lead over every other uh, company in terms of the handheld wireless uh, field. Now let's go to Facebook. Facebook has a $4 billion a year ad revenue. It exercises a muscular dominance in the social networking market and has 51% of all Internet users using its social networking site. And then we have Google. Congress has actually held hearings on the question, is Google too big? Is it a monopoly? I'm not saying whether it is or whether it isn't, but the question has been raised. Google has a capitalization of $296 billion. It's the largest company in the entire Internet software and services sector in America, if not the world. And it's, this is fascinating. It's LabX. You've probably heard in fact, Adam uh, may even know a great deal more about this than I do, the secrets of some of these companies, like the Lab X uh, over at, at Google. Uh, but but their, their innovation, innovative projects that we don't even know about yet fully are legendary, and all you have to do is check the cover of this week's Time magazine to be able to realize uh, the innovational power and perhaps even intellectual audacity of companies like Google. Here is the headline on Time Magazine, quote, Can Google Solve Death? The search giant is launching a venture to extend the human lifespan. Well, if they can do it, I applaud them. I applaud their engineering brilliance. But I have a less ambitious project for Google. My, my cover of my Time Magazine would say, Can Google Respect Free Speech? You know, Google owns YouTube. And YouTube has been somewhat notorious in shutting down, in some instances, a message from a conservative rabbi on moral issues, shutting down some um, messages by a Christian, uh, Christian youth pastor and similar messages that were not viewpoint appropriate and deemed, quote, hate speech because of their opinions. Now, so it's the power, ubiquity, um, and control over these channels of information uh, that is a concern. Number two. They do not trade in refrigerators or cars. They don't design clothing or perfume. They trade in our opinions, our communication, our viewpoints, our information, and our data. The information and opinions of Americans is the product that they channel. Now, they do tout themselves as advocates of free speech. And I can go into a number of quotes from their leaders indicating that they have this worldview belief, but it is time for them, I believe, to practice what they preach. We have released, uh, coincidental with today's um, discussion, our current assessment re report, which updates all the other reports that we've been doing for the John Milton Project about the state of free speech on these platforms. It's called the future of freedom of speech, free exercise of religion, and um, a free press. And we'll talk about the importance in a couple of minutes about free press uh, on the Internet uh, devices as well. But what's the future? Uh, we know what the past has been. What's the future? Uh, now, final thought before we get into our Q&A. Doctors and lawyers, I'm one, not a doctor, but I'm a lawyer, uh, are private uh, entrepreneurs. Every lawyer is not just a professional. He's also a businessman. Same thing with doctors. And yet their professions have guidelines and standards for the behavior of those that are members of their profession. 
And that's because of two things, I would suggest. Number one, because of the potential of doing harm to the public if they act recklessly or negligently or irresponsibly. Doctors, obviously, because of the physical power of the health of the patient in their hands, and lawyers because of the vast uh, power they have over the finances and legal rights of their clients. So because of the potential for doing great public damage, but also the potential for doing great public good, they have standards, they have guidelines for those in their profession that they're required uh, to abide by. The same thing for manufacturing companies. Manufacturing companies for many, many years have created their own associ safety associations and have their own self-regulatory safety standards for their own products and products of similar uh, manufacturers to ensure public safety and to make sure that they do no harm. I would suggest that it's time for new media companies like Google, Facebook, and Apple to voluntarily elevate their policies and their practices so that those policies and practices start looking more like the First Amendment and less occasionally like China or Iran. With that, we're going to go to the Q&A, but I'm going to introduce our esteemed panel, starting on the far right, Todd Starnes. Uh, he is a host of uh, Fox News and Commentary, heard daily on hundreds of radio stations. Throughout his journalism career, Todd has covered a number of high-profile stories, taking him from Wall Street to the White House. He is a regular contributor to Fox and & Friends and foxnews.com. He writes a weekly column for human events in townhall.com. He's the author of two books, Dispatches from Bitter America and a collection of essays detailing how President Obama has declared war on the values that has made this country great. And by the way, I love the title of this one, published in 2009, Todd's book, They Popped My Hood and Found Gravy on the Dipstick. <laughs> and that became an instant bestseller, and I can see why. The book was a collection of humorous and inspirational stories on a very serious subject, and that is Todd's open heart surgery in 2005. In his spare time, he's active in church, plays golf, follows SEC football, but near and dear to my heart, he's a lover of barbecue. Todd Starnes, <laughs> thank you. Welcome and uh, thank you for being part of our panel tonight. Eric Tietzel, to my immediate right, is an executive writer and speaker. He's the executive director of the Manhattan Declaration, and I referred to it a few minutes ago, uh, Chuck Colson's Call of Christian Conscience on Life, Marriage, and Religious Liberty, founded by Charles Colson uh, in 2009, and it is now uh, well over 500,000 signatories to that declaration, that statement of values uh, and belief. And by the way, he personally, Chuck personally, chose Eric Tietzel as his successor to head up the Manhattan Declaration Project um, before uh, his death. Uh, in terms of Eric's background, he earned a master's degree in college student affairs from Azusa Pacific University, joined the staff of Co Colorado Christian University, served uh, as uh, a staffer for U.S. Senator Bill Armstrong, and, uh, in, and also uh, associated with the great Michael Novak, a, a great uh, conservative thinker in America. Uh, and was part of constructing an innovational program at the American in Enterprise Institute dealing with values and capitalism and how the two uh, interrelate. He, um, uh, he is situated here in the Washington, D.C. area and I think is a tremendous resource uh, in terms of a firsthand experience, number one, that the Manhattan Declaration had for viewpoint censorship on Apple's platform but more importantly, this is a man, Eric Tietzel I'm referring to, who understands the importance of both free speech and free enterprise. And I want to emphasize that because we are not here to shut down free enterprise. We're great believers uh, at the NRB and the John Milton Project of both free speech, free enterprise. We think the two can coexist. The question is, how do we accomplish that? Uh, next to my immediate left is Adam Thier. Adam Thier is a senior research fellow with the Technology Policy Program at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Uh, he is really one of America's top gurus and experts in technology, media, internet, and free speech policies, uh, with a particular focus, by the way, which I think is terrific, on online child safety and digital privacy concerns, and he's written extensively in the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, and Forbes, and he's on television and radio. He's a frequent guest lecturer and um, a consultant to a lot of these 
major giant new media companies, and he's testified a number of times on Capitol Hill, and, and I've had the pleasure of uh, participating in some events with Adam previously, and he's also uh, graced us with his presence on one of these panels uh, previously. He was the past president also of the Progress and Freedom Foundation here in Washington, D.C., director of telecommunication studies at Cato Institute, and a senior fellow in the past at the Heritage Foundations, both with an MA in international business and trade theory at the University of Maryland, also a BA in journalism and political philosophy from Indiana University. Last but not least, Trevor Burris at the far left is a research fellow at Cato Institute's Center for Constitutional Studies. Uh, his specialty includes constitutional law, civil and criminal law, legal and political philosophy, and legal history. His work has appeared in the Vermont Law Review, the Syracuse Law Review, the Jurist, as well as Washington Times, Huffington Post, the Daily Caller, Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, USA Today. He has a BA in philosophy from the University of Colorado at Boulder and a law degree from the University of Denver Sturm College of Law. And I've had the privilege of debating uh, Trevor at, I think it was universe, uh, Washington University here in Washington, D.C., uh, over the uh, very interesting case of FCC versus Fox on indecency policies, one which we had a respectful disagreement, but I enjoyed it thoroughly. Uh, thoroughly. So let me start out uh, going to the far right on questions. And uh, excuse me, before we get into questions, we're going to give everybody a chance for a, a two or three minute introductory statements. I'm going to go into questions when I do. We're going to be starting from right to left, but then we're going to mix it up. And by the way, I want to remind you, gentlemen, when we get to the Q&A, part of this on the panel, please feel free to jump in, even if uh, you're not the person that I lead off with with that particular question. So we're going to start with Todd first with a few introductory comments and go uh, from right, my right to my left in terms of anything you want to say as an opening. Go ahead, Todd. Well, thank you very much, and I uh, would, uh, would like to thank the NRB for uh, this great event. And I take exception that the uh, Fox guy is on the far right side of the panel. <laughs> is that what, uh, did I hear you correctly there? <laughs> uh, I guess you could say I am the bad boy of Facebook. Uh, I, I got banished from Facebook and Twitter and Amazon, uh, so uh, YouTube. Uh, so I've just uh, I've sort of uh, developed a really bad reputation on the social networking sites. Uh, I was one of the early pioneers of uh, of joining um, those uh, those social networking organizations. I remember when I um, when I first uh, joined Twitter, my family, my my great aunt back in the South, a, a very reverent and fervent Methodist. Uh, I told her, I said, Aunt Lynn, I've joined uh, Twitter, and she put me on the church prayer list. Uh, she didn't know what was going on. She said, just don't do it in public. So, uh, so I, I really truly see that uh, social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube, uh, they have such value, uh, not just in, in our day-to-day -day conversations, but in sharing news stories and sharing information and getting the word out there about issues that impact us. And uh, it's very important for me as a journalist who covers uh, these attacks on our American values and attacks on religious liberty. And, uh, and sadly, and as you will hear uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout this session, uh, this is a very real issue. Just this week, I've got close to about 150 messages from my Facebook followers uh, telling me that they were unable to share stories about religious persecution underway in the military. So uh, th this is happening now, and I'm so excited that the NRB is addressing this very important issue so we can inform people, educate people, so they can do something about it, as Governor, Hu Governor Huckabee just said. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming this morning. Uh, thanks very much. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Craig, and uh, to my friend Aaron, too. Um, I was just thinking about how funny it is that um, this conversation is occurring in this room and that I get to be a part of it uh, for two primary reasons. Uh, the first is that the Manhattan Declaration held its public launch right here in this room uh, in November of 2009, um, uh, featuring Chuck Colson and a whole range of other religious leaders. Um, a second reason is that uh, I was born on January 24th, 1984. Uh, which was the day of the Super Bowl, uh, but um, more memorably, it was the day that Apple launched for the only time that it ever ran publicly, their iconic Super Bowl ad um, for the Apple II computer, I think it was. Um, you all will remember, and if you don't remember, you can go find it on YouTube, uh, a video showing a female dressed in white carrying a hammer, um, running through a crowd of drones who are all watching Big Brother um, indoctrinate them, and she throws the hammer into this screen and it explodes. 
Um, and the point is that Apple Computer is here to uh, free us from indoctrination, to enable us to, as I think a later ad campaign would say, think different. Well, uh, here we are. And, uh, and uh, I represent an organization that was banished from the iTunes store um, for having the audacity to do just that, to think different. And uh, isn't it ironic? Thank you, Eric. Adam? Well, thank you, Craig. I appreciate uh, you inviting me here again today to make some remarks. I'm going to make four simple points to kick things off and hopefully in, uh, encourage a little bit of a debate about this uh, challenging issue uh, built largely upon some remarks I made last time you invited me here. Um, my first point is this. The power of the state to censor is sweeping and complete in its effect. By contrast, the power of private intermediaries to censor is limited and very leaky. There exist today more avenues for Christians and people of all faiths and beliefs and values to get their opinions and their message out. We do no longer live in a world of media monopoly. We live in a world of media abundance. Second point, unless you want to convert private platforms into the equivalent of common carriers or public utilities, you must grant those private platforms editorial discretion under the First Amendment. And if you were to actually convert them into some sort of quasi-common carrier or public uh, utility, you would place the state, ironically enough, in a position of having greater control over the speech on those platforms, something we should be wary about. Third, in this regard, there's really nothing new under the sun. We've been having the same debate we're having here today for the past century over the platforms of the day, whether it was newspapers, radio, broadcast television, cable TV, and so on. This is just an old debate, usually under the name of media access theory, about what private parties should be doing and how much they should look like state actors. Fourth and finally, while today's First Amendment jurisprudential standard as applied to the state is excellent in my opinion, as a general matter it would be a mistake to apply, apply it to private actors and their own private speech platforms because it, it would end up undermining their ability to tailor their online communities and their speech to their audiences. And think about it. Go back through just some of the recent jurisprudence that's been handed down over the past 15 years starting with ACLU versus Reno in the mid-90s, essentially dealing with online pornography and saying the state could have very little role in censoring it. Or how about Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition, a case that essentially said it was constitutional for people to place online computer-generated depictions of child pornography. Or how about U.S. versus Stevens in 2010, which authorized animal cruelty videos, not depictions, actual animal cruelty videos to be posted online. And how about Brown versus EMA, a case that said you could not put laws in place to block kids from buying violent video games. Now look, we could debate these cases and these decisions. Personally, I have filed in almost every one of those cases and said that this was the way to go, and I was glad with the outcome that leaned in the direction of greater free speech and First Amendment protections. But we absolutely should not expect that to be the standard for private intermediaries. I would not expect to go to Facebook or anything that Google owns or to Twitter or anywhere else, or to the National Religious Broadcaster site, and expect that that standard has to apply to everybody. I want everybody to be able to create their own standard, craft it for their particular online communities, to create what the philosopher Robert Nozick called a utopia of utopias. I think that's the internet. I think we don't have one vision of the way everything should work just right, and that it includes free speech. We should have sort of a thousand flowers blooming, not just one. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Craig. Uh, and I suspected Adam and I would agree 100% on all of this stuff, so we do. Uh, he's a former Cato guy anyway. Um, my perspective on this, I'm not a tech policy guy. I'm a free speech absolutist guy. My free speech area, mostly at Cato, is campaign finance. And mostly in the free speech realm, I see different people having the same debate all over again. Free speech is often very uh, more controversial than people admit in the sense that you generally like the idea of free speech, but when you ask specific questions of whether or not these people who you don't like should be allowed to speak, speak you say, well, no, not that. Uh, similarly here, I don't think that uh, Apple or Google or Facebook or any of these companies uh, censoring, and I, I will grant, uh, but I'll talk about this my, my more substantial remarks, I will grant that there is a Christian bias out there. But I don't think any of them censoring uh, Christians or anyone else is, a, is you know, contrary to the American vision. I think it is an affirmation of the American vision of the difference between the private and the public sphere. 
And generally speaking, we've been having a debate about the difference between the private and the public sphere in a variety of areas. Uh, Adam mentioned common carriers. Uh, that happened in the late 19th century. But it is being eroded on all levels at all, uh, by all different types of groups who are asserting that the private sphere has too many influences on the public sphere. Therefore, there needs to be some sort of control or jurisdiction over it. I completely deny that. And I think that it is absolutely crucial that the private sphere remain a bulwark of liberty upon which liber it, liberty is impossible. So as a libertarian, I'm trying to draw lines, albeit you know, difficultly and perfectly, to say, no, you cannot go into the sphere uh, to manipulate or regulate it. And that's part of the American Freedom Project. So I appreciate uh, the invitation, Craig, and I look forward to the discussion. Good. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, Todd, let's start with you. Now, you shared a little bit about your Facebook page being taken down and now a huge amount of anecdotal evidence from some of your followers on the things that are happening to them. Well, let, let me go to your position, put, put on your journalist and broadcaster hat for a minute. How important is Facebook? How ubiquitous? Uh, how often is it used or relied on by journalists today in terms of an adjunct to what you do as a journalist? Well, I know for me it's, it's a very important tool uh, for getting information, especially those uh, breaking news uh, items. Uh, perhaps something happens to someone in a community and they will relay that information to us via Facebook. Uh, the challenge, of course, is, is verifying and second sourcing and in some instances triple sourcing that information to, to make sure it is in fact accurate. Uh, but, uh, but Facebook, and especially even more so Twitter, I think, has become uh, such a major part of, of journalism these days where uh, there is an immediacy to the news coverage uh, and we're really not able to sit back like we used to do you know, five, even ten years ago and, and really sort of take a look and, and take a breath and understand what the story is. It's happening immediately. It's happening in real time. So I think from that standpoint, uh, those as Facebook and, and Twitter have become very, very important tools for, for us as journalists. Now, Todd, is there any question in your mind that the takedown of your Facebook page, as an example, was something that was based on the content, the opinions, as opposed to a technical glitch? Absolutely not. Uh, that's just a load of fertilizer. And uh, y'all have to excuse me. I'm from the South originally, even though I live in New York City. So I like to savor my vowels. So if y'all, uh, uh, so my apologies if, if you may, if some of my words sound strange. Um, I, I want to take you back to uh, a couple of stories. Uh, I first became aware of the Facebook uh, issue and involving their uh, blocking and censoring uh, conservatives about a year ago. There's a group called the Chicks on the Right, uh, two uh, moms uh, in Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, who uh, love uh, politics and the Kardashians, and uh, they have a website featuring both. And uh, they said something derogatory about President Obama in a posting. It wasn't profane. It was just derogatory. It was just whatever it was. And they found themselves immediately blocked. They have more than 100,000 followers on Facebook, and they could not get that block lifted. Someone on Facebook, one of my Facebook followers, sent me a note. They said, Todd, have you heard about the chicks on the right? And again, it launched a story. So we got the information. We did a story. We put it on the front page of foxnews.com, and guess what happened? Facebook lifted the block. They said it was an accident, uh, that uh, it happened incidentally. Well, um, a couple of months later, this happened uh, right after Paula Deen. Uh, remember the Paula Deen controversy? Well, I had come out in support of, uh, of Paula Deen, and I had uh, po posted a, um, a Facebook message. And I want to read this message because this is what got me blocked from Facebook. And then I want to tell you what happened. After. This is what I wrote. I'm about as politically incorrect as you can get. I'm wearing an NRA ball cap, eating a Chick-fil-A sandwich, reading a Paula Deen cookbook, sipping a 20-ounce sweet tea while sitting in my Cracker Barrel rocking chair, listening to the Gaither vocal band singing Jesus Saves on the Stereo with a Gideon's Bible in my pocket. Yes, sir, I'm politically incorrect and happy as a June bug. That got me blocked. Uh, I received a message from Facebook that said, we removed this from Facebook because it violates our community standards. Uh, so they, they blocked me, and there wasn't anything I could do about it. So I told my bosses at Fox, I said, guys, here's what happened. And so we did another front page, front page story about this. And not only did Facebook end up lifting the block, they sent us an apology. And, I wanna, uh, and the concern was, they said I violated Facebook's community standards. And uh, 
I decided to look up on their, their Ten Commandments that they had there, and among their thou shalt nots were bans on nudity, bullying, harassment, graphic content, and pornography and spam. And uh, I wrote in a column, to the best of my knowledge, I was not buck naked. Uh, Miss Paula wasn't doing anything untoward with a stick of butter. Uh, but my Facebook does have some spam. But in my defense, uh, it was a recipe for fried spam sandwiches. So I, I just don't see how I possibly violated their standards. But they did send me an apology. Uh, and they said it was just inadvertent. Uh, someone had made a mistake, possibly in their Cincinnati office, where the IRS is located. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but uh, but it, was a, it was a classic example of this stuff is, is happening, Craig, and unfortunately, if you don't have a big stick like foxnews.com to, to tell your story, sadly, many people, and I've gotten hundreds, hundreds of messages from people saying they have been blocked because of something they wrote about President Obama or something they wrote about um, traditional marriage, and there's nothing those folks can do about it. And so it is a very real problem, and when they say it's just a simple mistake or a glitch, I say not true. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Uh, now let me go to Eric uh, Tietzel. Uh, if you'd share just a little bit about the background of the Manhattan Declaration, uh, why it was created, and then what happened when you wanted it uh, to become an app on uh, Apple's uh, phenomenal iTunes app store. Yeah, um, so uh, in the fall of 2009, Chuck Colson um, had what I think we can call a prescient vision for um, what was going to happen in American culture. Uh, if you'll think back to those days, we're talking about um, the ongoing financial crisis brought about by the fall of the housing market, um, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, the election of President Obama. Um, and yet Chuck thought life, marriage, and religious freedom, these are key issues that we need to start talking about. So we got together with his friends, Robert George from Princeton University and Timothy George from Beeson Divinity School. They talked about the idea of a declaration that would describe um, in theological and philosophical terms the significance for the church, um, including Christians, Catholic, excuse me, evangelicals, Catholics, and Orthodox Christians um, on, these three, uh, on these three issues. So Robbie George took a stab at a draft, and then they sent it out to about 150 religious leaders from those communities, got a lot of feedback, uh, pounded out a final version, and right here at the National Press Club in November of 2009, they released what came to be known as the Manhattan Declaration. Um, in very short order, they uh, achieved something like 425,000 signers. Um, I think it was uh, uh, four or five months that they hit that point. Um, the Manhattan Declaration was everywhere. Every major Christian leader in America, it seems, was blogging about whether or not they signed and why. Um, and, and many people were being encouraged to lend their voice to this document, which says, we as Christians believe that life, marriage, and religious freedom are of primary significance, and, uh, and that while we respect the state and we acknowledge that the authority of the state actually comes from God and we have a responsibility to obey it, um, that responsibility does not uh, extend so far as situations that um, where man's law uh, comes head to head with, with God's law, that God's law is uh, our, our priority and therefore we won't render to Caesar what belongs to God. Um, in, uh, in 2010, about a year after the initial launch, uh, the folks who were working on the Manhattan Declaration decided to do an app. And it was a very basic, simple app where you could read the declaration, share it with people, and it had a, a quiz. And from what I've read, it sounds like it was kind of a kind of a nerdy, very simple quiz that said, do you believe that marriage is between a man and a woman? And if you said yes, you got it right. And if you said no, you got it wrong. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so that launched in October. Um, a petition was started on change.org shortly thereafter. It got, I think, 7,700 signatures from people who wanted to see the iTunes market drop this app. And uh, over Thanksgiving weekend in 2010, um, the app disappeared. And there was no notice. No one at the Manhattan Declaration was told. It, it was just gone. Um, so they obviously began to ask questions and, uh, and figured out what had happened. A spokesperson for Apple told someone else that um, uh, despite the fact that when it originally launched, it was given a four plus rating, which means it had no objectionable content. Um, the spokesperson said that they found it to be offensive to large groups of people. That's the quote. Um, so we took out the quiz and uh, uh, the rest of the app remained the same and they resubmitted it along with their own petition, which had over 45,000 signers saying that we would like to see this reinstated and uh, never received an answer. And so it has been 
banned to this day. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Um, now, let me go to Adam. Uh, I know, Adam, you uh, have an opportunity to consult with a lot of these companies. You know a lot more about the inside technical stuff that they go through in terms of monitoring and managing their sites than well, most of us in this room. Uh, I had a conversation with one of the policy <laughs> folks at Facebook some time ago, and I was told, first of all, I, I think it's pretty, pretty well known that Facebook has about a billion people regularly using its social networking system. That's how large they are. I was told by their policy staff that, and this was maybe six to eight months ago, so that it may even be more now, that they have to manage about a million complaints a week from people who say, oh, you got to take a look at this because I think it violates content policies. Okay, so that's a million a week. That's a lot of complaints. I think about that uh, uh, Lucy television program in the 50s, you know, where she's at the conveyor belt in the bakery, you know, and she can't keep up. And so some of that stuff's going to fall to the ground. I think she started eating some of the candy because she couldn't box it all. That's comedy, but this is more like tragedy. Um, so should we just give them a pass on this and say, look, you're, you're doing the you're rowing as hard as you can, you're dancing as fast as you can, we're just going to give you a pass. Uh, what's your attitude about that? No, we shouldn't give them a pass. I mean, this is where, uh, you know, in a, a form of pressure that we can put on either individually or collectively can make a real difference. We do need to keep in mind, however, that as you just suggested, Facebook in particular, as well as sites like YouTube and Twitter, these are big communities. It's like trying to set up uh, acceptable use policies or community standards for everybody that comes into a shopping mall on a daily basis. Um, that's really hard. Uh, people of all different beliefs and attitudes come into shopping malls and, you know, we do set standards or the private parties that run those places set standards, not all of which we will agree with when we walk into them. Um, we can put pressure on those establishments, just as we can put pressure on Facebook and YouTube and others. But we do need to understand that at some point, with all the different varying groups that are vying for some space there or trying to use that platform, it's going to be really hard. And it's, you know, I work with them uh, on a lot of issues, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, related to hate speech. And, you know, there's some legitimately really troubling things that are said every single day between individuals on these platforms, not just about religious issues, but about everything under the sun, harassment of all sorts. And, uh, it's, it's really hard to know where you draw these lines. I gave the example last time I was here, Craig, and I'll, I'll do it again. I've, w I've worked with folks at the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, because they've had huge concerns about um, various types of uh, uh, anti-Semitic content on various types of online platforms. They went to Google many years ago, and after seeing some just horrific search results come up with, with the search term Jew, they got an agreement not to block that term, not to block the results or to demote the results that were coming up which were anti-Semitic, but to basically get like a little pop-up box on the side almost in the form of an ad that said, if you're not liking what you see here, here's why you're seeing it and here's other things you could look at. That's a counter speech effort, right? Which is almost always the better way so, to so go. So the remedy there was not takedown, but more speech, speech, labeling. Uh, yeah. yeah, the pr only problem with that solution, however, is they couldn't do it for every single group. It was done for the search term Jew, but for other types of derogatory terms or, or hateful terms, mm -hmm. it was not, there was no pop-up. So where does Google draw the line? I, I don't know. It's hard, right? They can't probably do it for everybody. Okay. Uh, let me switch over to you, Trevor. Let's go, let's go to the basics, because we're not all lawyers here. Uh, but there is something most of us can probably agree to, those of us who have JD after our name. And that is, it seems clear, now I'm going to hedge more than probably you will, but it seems clear that the First Amendment only applies to, quote, state actors, which means government or arms of the government, rather than private companies, private entities, mm -hmm. right? So you'd agree that there's no law right now, no court decision that we can rely on that would say the First Amendment, I have a First Amendment right when I post on Facebook not to have Facebook take down my opinions, right? Mm -hmm. But Facebook itself has First Amendment rights against government regulating it to some degree, certainly. Okay, all right. We'll, we'll start that as we we'll start that as the basic. Now, uh, by the way, I'm not sure if you caught this or not. There was a Fourth Circuit case that came down recently, uh, and I, I know it only because I kept following this. The Lane Photography? Uh, no, this was the Bland, uh, Bland versus Roberts. Fourth Circuit uh, case, and it's September 18th, so it's very, very recent. It's a, I think it was a deputy in a sheriff's department 
who hit like on the political Facebook mm. of the opponent of his boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember this, yeah. Okay, now, like his protected might speech, not, yeah. yeah, might not be politically savvy, <laughs> but, but it, it's political free speech. So the question is, is hitting like, you know, using a button to say you like or not like or unlike someone on Facebook, is that expressive speech? Mm -hmm. Fourth Circuit said, yeah. Now, agree or disagree I on agree, that? yeah. Okay, I don't know whether that's gonna go up to the Supremes or not, but uh, I think a lot of us who deal in civil liberty stuff will probably agree, yeah, that, that makes sense. Either it's symbolic speech or actual speech or, or, or both. Now, the question is, um, taking the First Amendment and putting it in a, in, off the shelf for a minute and talking not about First Amendment rights that we have, all of us, on Facebook, Google, Apple, and so forth, but First Amendment values Mm -hmm. cultural, social, moral aspect of free speech being something good for America, generally speaking. Uh, and I think we'd agree, and certainly people at Cato would agree, that that's an important value. Why not encourage these companies to ascribe to a higher standard? Or is it just me that they're not ascribing to a higher standard? <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you can encourage them all you want. I, I would say that the, the First Amendment applies, uh, in this sense, zero to... Facebook and Google and others. I also think that it is very important to realize, as you said, that they have a First Amendment right themselves of exclusion. And of course, the analogy here would be whether or not national religious broadcasters have to put ads for uh, pro-gay marriage on their website. And if you're not going to want that to happen, then you have to figure out some distinction between common carriers, which would be something like this. Like, and we keep talking about size here, and whether or not size is a sufficient enough distinction to bring them under the, the heel, but what we're really talking about is whether or not we want to possibly eliminate, uh, if we wanted to make all websites have to you know, obey free speech, or what sort of principle would we draw in between? The principle I draw is private property. It's pretty easy to apply. Uh, you don't need to have the fr First Amendment apply whatsoever. So you can go to a website that you, and say absolutely offensive things, and there's nothing the government can do about it. That is a good thing. That is a freedom-promoting endeavor, I would say, in general. The big concern here is, is there might be you know, a bizarro world, or this world right now, uh, where you know, maybe two blocks over, we have the National Feminist Broadcasters meeting, and they're talking about how Apple, Google, and Facebook are uh, promoting hate speech for women, or, allow, or, or, or censoring, uh, allowing too much hate speech for women, and maybe censoring certain types of feminist speech. So they're trying to figure out how to get Apple, Google, and Facebook to respond to their demands. And I just generally say, just keep, you know, we, we don't want to spawn more groups who have political control over the private content of, of private property and just say, keep it out, depoliticize it. Because as soon as you politicize it, it's a different game. The question I want to keep, keep in everyone's mind here is every single time that, that we hear from Todd or anyone else how they got Facebook to respond or how they got Apple to respond or maybe didn't respond, which one is easier to affect if we took this into the government realm? Which one is better? I mean, yes, people screw up and censor speech sometimes, but Facebook is probably better at listening than the government in general. I would suggest perhaps they're, they're getting close. <laughs> uh, but here's the difference, you see, uh, Trevor. In, it seems to me that in the government, at least we have legal procedures that are guaranteed to work most of the time in terms of due process, fair hearing, and so forth. The complaint I've gotten from a lot of folks is that they have tried the complaint process, and when you're a private company, you have the power of simply ignoring. Government, you can file all kinds of legal petitions, get into court, file lawsuits, and so forth. In fact, when this, I mentioned this truckers incident, uh, where the truckers' Facebook page was closed down because they were going to come to Washington to protest President Obama's policies. And there's a radio talk show host who said, I'm going to file a class action lawsuit on the First Amendment against Facebook. And of course, the irony is, of course, that will not be successful for that reason. So then I'm, we're going to be talking a lot, at least I'm going to try to stimulate discussion about, number one, what kinds of theories, what kinds of worldview standards are we going to all agree to that are good for free speech? If we can come to a consensus that certain values are good and certain practices and policies would be better for these companies to practice than others, then the second question is how do we get them voluntarily, on a voluntary basis, to recognize that we're right? Now, let me start with the first one. Um, 
how do we set up a theoretical justification for ever talking free speech to these companies? Because frankly, you know, you go to a, uh, a bakery and you say, I don't like the baked goods you sell. And they say, well, go somewhere else. You go to a clothing store and say, you know, you don't, you don't cover, uh, you provide certain kinds of clothes that I want to wear. They say, well, go somewhere else. So is, are they, the, the, the companies that run information and data services and internet web interactive platforms, are they simply people selling widgets, cars, manufacturing goods, or is there a moral obligation, not a legal one, but is there a moral obligation in America for a company that trades not on fabric but on our viewpoints to make their billions to ascribe to a higher standard. And let me start with you, Trevor, but I want to go to Todd in a minute after that. I mean, to my, my question is, uh, just, is there a moral obligation for national religious broadcasters to have pro-gay marriage uh, ads on their website? On our website. Then let me go to that point. Now, here's my paradigm. You're free to accept it. You're free to reject it. Uh, but when I was in college, I was the editor of a college newspaper, and I was thinking about going into the wor world of journalism and got corrupted and went to law school instead. <laughs> um, but I was, uh, I was a, a reporter for the local newspaper, a stringer, uh, in addition to being the editor of my college newspaper. So I had some serious thoughts about going into journalism. And in the old-fashioned paradigm, and maybe it still holds today, in the brick-and-mortar newspaper world, and of course we all know newspapers are all going online or they're bankrupt or, you know, many of them are not printing anymore. I know USA Today, I think, just went up to two bucks a, an issue. Um, but in the old paradigm, at the top floor is the publisher and the editor making editorial decisions. Then you got uh, the news editors, daily editors and reporters, kind of middle level floor on the building. And then down below, you'd have the printing presses, the guys that run these things. And they don't do with this anymore. They push electronic buttons. Uh, and in many of the newspapers that I was familiar with, the printing press operation was actually owned by a different company from the corporate standpoint, although they were given space in the basement. But the, the guy running the printing press, even though it was a separate company, they had a contract saying, we'll print your newspapers. The printer couldn't say, hold the presses. I just read something in here I don't like. Tell the publisher on the top floor, the guy who generates the content, I don't like his ideas, so I'm not going to print it. Now, I know there's business reasons why he would never do that. But my paradigm, my uh, vision for the internet is that our website or your Facebook page or what you send in an email on Google, that makes you an editor in chief at the top floor. You're the content and opinion maker. The internet, Google, Facebook, these are the guys in the basement controlling the printing press. This is the modern day printing press. And they're telling us, as editors, we don't like your opinions. Now, that's the reason I don't agree with your analogy, because our website makes us the editors of our content. Facebook, Google, Apple, they have minimal um, content. I think Facebook's got its own Facebook page. But they're in the business of using, as a conduit, our information. That makes them a little bit different. Go ahead. So, Craig, you, you're doing everything except saying that they should be essentially common carriers. Yes. You're, you're, you're saying that these intermediaries are important enough that the they should serve as the neutral uh, pathways for speech. That sounds good, but I think as a matter of law, this, this principle is fairly settled, that if they're private entities, it's private property, they have editorial discretion. This matter is before the court right now in, the, in a Verizon case uh, versus the FCC mm -hmm. on the net neutrality question, right? Does Verizon have editorial discretion to, in some way, shape, or form, modify and or even censor speech that goes over its platforms? Now, you could at least make the argument with Verizon that they have in the past been treated as a common carrier. This is not true for Facebook or Twitter or Google. Let's remember, folks, these things haven't even existed for a decade. I mean, if we were here 40 years ago, we'd be talking about newspapers this way. And at least in that context, we could say, well, there's only the Washington Post locally. And then you could make a monopoly argument. But you can't make that argument here to justify them being treated as essentially neutral arbiters or common carriers. I just don't think it works in a world of media abundance. Is there a line? And I mentioned uh, Facebook's got a 51% share of all internet users using its site. Uh, is there a line at which you would concede 
that free speech is in danger in the practical sense, if not the legal sense, because of the ubiquity and power of some of these platforms? I, I think Facebook's a massive platform. Google's a huge company. Twitter's a major force in our society. There have always been huge media intermediaries. The good news is there's more now than ever before. The even better news is, is that when we, when we hear the other examples we heard earlier from, from Eric and Todd, you know, their message did get out. I can go to my browser, I can type in the Manhattan Declaration, I can find the things that, that Todd's written in other ways. So it's not just one option, whereas in the old days, I would have been far more concerned about their plight. I think, I, I, are you asking, Craig, too, like whether or not there would be some monopolization of, of information conveyance that would be so pervasive that it would compromise First Amendment values? Right. Right. So like one company controlling all the internet, controlling all of our Google. Well, you know. And it's never going to be all, but is there a line at which it's most? So this is, uh, I mean, again, as long as you maintain like private property is, a, is the rule and open access, then it's not a problem. If you wanted to start Christian face, Facebook, if Facebook went completely, you know, absolutely against religious in all way, then you should, and that's fine. And and then cr the reason you support the private property value is so on Christian Facebook, you're allowed to censor who you want to censor. And of course, we're assuming that all of us, like in the old days, some levers and drums, and you could put together your own printing press. Putting together your own Facebook page really creates a little bit more of a dilemma. but. That's a monopoly issue. Now, of course, there are restraints against trade. There are unfair trade practice regulations. There are limits on monopoly power, antitrust. I'm not suggesting these ought to be applied. I'm not even suggesting that they should be regulated. What I am saying is that we may get to a point where internet web devices and platforms like these are so ubiquitous and so essential to what we do. And by the way, Twitter has for a long time described itself as a social utility. And Facebook has done the same thing. Now, had I been corporate counsel to them, I would have <laughs> chosen a different, uh, a different <laughs> phrase because regulators look for that term and say, well, if you're a utility, maybe we should regulate you like the telephone company. But that's another discussion. So just to stress, no one within NRB or the uh, NRB uh, John Milton Project is suggesting that this is the time for regulation or legislation to require action. But we are saying that is there at least a intellectual argument that can be made that these companies would be better off, and frankly, free speech in America from a social standpoint, would be better off with better policies. I mean, I spent the first 10 years out of my 35-year trial practice before coming to NRB as in-house counsel uh, trying cases involving complex accidents, airplane uh, tragedies and other things. And very often I would find that the catastrophes could be traced to either uh, bad po uh, safety policies or good safety policies that were not well effectuated. So certainly I think we can agree good policies, higher standard free speech policies that made sense uh, would be better for America and maybe even better for these companies as a free speech standard. Well, I agree with that, Craig. And in, when we uh, had our last discussion on this and I wrote about it afterwards, I, I praised this document as a good starting point and, and said, look. Which is why I invited you. Absolutely. <laughs> I tell you, you brown, brown you doesn't get you everywhere in you this can world, make right? around this town. <laughs> uh, but the point is, is that as a baseline, as a set of sort of best practices or even an industry code of conduct for private speech intermediaries, I think you've got it right. And I think the First Amendment provides a pretty good set of uh, guidelines. I'm, I think what we're saying uh, over here on this side is that it can't be absolute, is that it can't be, as a legal matter, the enforced standard against those private intermediaries. But I'm with you. I'm with you on it should be the standard, the norm that they start from, but then they do have to figure out how do we appeal to the broad community of interest and do we do any tailoring? You know, Apple, you know, Apple's exec, Tim Cook, he's gay. A lot of top executives there are gay. They obviously feel very strongly about those issues sure. and gay marriage issues. I bet they feel every bit as strongly as Chick-fil-A does and their founder on the opposite side. I support both Chick-fil-A and Apple's right to do whatever they want with their platforms in terms of speeching, spe speaking about these issues. So that's the question is where we start the baseline is fine. I would hope they start both of them supporting free speech but there'll be times when they wouldn't want to be forced to provide the other party's speech on their platforms or establishments. By the way, uh, coincidental with today's event is our release of our, this current assessment report, and it should be in the packets that you received when you came in here. And one of the things that we cited is that the fact that Facebook, Google, and Apple all filed 
amicus curiae, friend of the court briefs with the United States Supreme Court on the Defense of Marriage Act, the, the marriage case. Uh, and they were all, of course, supporting the idea of uh, the freedom of, of people to have uh, recognized marriages in terms of uh, same-sex marriage and striking down DOMA on that basis. Now, we also indicated in our current assessment that they had every right to do that. We respect their freedom to uh, opine uh, in that way in the public forum and to hold those values. But it seems to me, again, we're not talking about legality. Now we're talking about um, perhaps social and political philosophy a little bit. It seems to me that any company that uh, has a specific voiced public opinion in these matters, in these great issues of the day, has an even higher obligation to check itself to make sure it's a neutral and objective arbiter as much as possible of the information upon which they trade and make their billions and billions of dollars and, uh, and serve the public. So uh, with that, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into, uh, Todd, did you have something to say? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think we're moving towards a, a time uh, in the country where you're not going to be allowed to have an opinion on that particular issue involving uh, gay marriage. So there's only one correct viewpoint and the other is going to be considered some sort of a hate crime or, or hate speech. And I think that's one of the reasons we've seen in most of these instances of censorship or blocking on Facebook and the social networking sites is had to do with, with stories or comments about gay marriage versus traditional marriage. So I believe that is a telling sign of, of things to come in this country where you're not going to be able to speak, you're not going to be able to have the opinion that you believe in traditional marriage without some sort of a repercussion. Yeah, and, and again, you know, public debate in America doesn't take place in a vacuum. It requires a public park or the opportunity to meet together and assemble and voice your opinions and have access to you know, some, some opportunities to make your voice known. And that doesn't mean that we have to create a regulation to say everyone ha has to have the equal opportunity to say the equal things in an equal time, place, and manner. Clearly, that's, th yeah, well, that's so not what we're saying. So here's the, here's the unescapable pr problem that, uh, that Todd raised here that as businesses, they're going to, gen we can predict that they'll generally go in line with the majority of their customers. So I actually agree with Todd, with Todd that there will be a time, and it's coming, when, when it's incredibly shameful to have, to, it will be seen as very shameful to speak out for traditional marriage. I think that that will happen. I think the same thing has happened with racism. It is very shameful. And it's not Facebook or Google who made that happen. It's social mores changing. Um, and so now the racists who still want to talk about you know, antebellum policies, they go to their own forums. And they, they, they run their own forums to do this, to talk about that. And Facebook is under no obligation, especially as someone who's serving customers, uh, to give them a, an opportunity to speak out on their, on their hateful speech because they're reacting to customer demands. And that's the other thing that's really important here. You talked about how Facebook and Google don't have like a due process type of way of challenging. Uh, unlike government, you can go through procedures to challenge. Uh, they don't have that, but they do have something that the government doesn't have, which is they have public shaming. I mean, that, that, and, that, and that's a, a, something you can do to Facebook and Google, and you can't really do very well to the government. <laughs> <laughs> now, many of us have found that to be true, Trevor, by the way. I, I want to reiterate that, actually. This is a very important point because, you know, the power of public pressure is enormous and can make a difference in this country. Last time I checked, there are a lot of Christians in this country. <laughs> and I think they could probably come together more on issues like this and push back against large uh, uh, internet intermediaries on a variety of issues. Um, I think at the margins we've seen that work, but I don't think they've made their presence felt enough. And I, I mean, I don't know if we'll ever get to a day where we could have a mass exodus out of Facebook. I personally left Facebook. I left it, I'm an, I'm an internet guy. I do internet policy, but Facebook to me is like being in a digital nudi nudist colony. <laughs> You're expected to sort of bury your soul and give up your privacy at every juncture, and I sort of try to keep my kids off it. And, you know, there's a time and a place for its activity, but I'm not, I'm not into it. So I'm, I don't know why more people don't walk. I tell this to privacy advocates who are all concerned about Facebook for a totally different set of reasons. Mm -hmm. You're concerned about it because of more of the speech-related speech stuff. I appreciate both sets of concerns. I, I put my money where my mouth is, and I got the hell out of there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 let me respond to that, Adam. In fact, actually also uh, jump off of a point that Trevor made about, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a free marketplace of ideas, and let's let our, our opinions be known and let the chips fall where they may. Uh, and that's true except for this. In the weeks leading up to the DOMA arguments, the oral arguments in, in the Supreme Court, 
the research that has been done from a media standpoint shows that a five to one margin, the mainstream media was printing favorable, pro-gay favorable articles and anti-traditional marriage arguments five to one in the weeks leading up to oral arguments. Now, you can call me a conspiratorialist. You know, I'm sometimes the president of that club <laughs> um, as well as a, 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 a loyal member. But I do believe that the mainstream media has a fixed attitude about certain things. Not everything, but certain things. And they have decided, and I believe wrongly, that somehow this is the new racism uh, of the 21st century. And they don't want to be left behind. Uh, in the 20th century, the great moral issue, one of the great civil rights issues, was, was uh, racism based on skin color. And that was, I don't think, a debatable issue as to whether or not a person based on his skin color should be treated differently in terms of basic privileges and rights. And that was beyond debate, although certain people use certain arguments uh, that now we find to be astounding to try to justify racism. But I think it's a debatable, reasonable debatable issue as to whether or not homosexual relationships can be equivalent to um, uh, a, 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 an African American marrying a white woman uh, protected in the Loving versus Virginia case, uh, should it also likely be treated as equal in terms of same-sex marriage. That's a debatable issue. And I think many of the nuances have never really been ironed out because the channels of institutional power in academia and in the mainstream media made their decision and told us, the American people, what to believe. And many people get their mores fashioned by the entertainment, the music industry, and by what they read but, in but the mainstream media. But what you're saying is this, the obvious truism we've always dealt with, which is media bias exists, right? It, we know this. This has always been, to some extent, the truth. Like I said, let's take ourselves back a few decades and recall that we had a much bigger problem when it was just only a handful of television broadcasters and local radio stations and one local newspaper that we could deal with and try to get our views and beliefs out there, and we just couldn't. I mean, we fought battles about this. This went all the way to the Supreme Court. I mean, the Tornillo case in the yes. early 70s yeah. decided as a matter of principle that even though those options are limited, even though you have only so many outlets, it doesn't make a difference. They have a right of editorial discretion. At least today, we do have more ways to get the word out, even in the midst of continued media bias. And I would, I would agree, definite bias against Christians. I agree, too. But, but one of the uh, other good parts about this, um, keeping you know, not, not, we didn't declare the three networks common, common carriers. Uh, but one of the best parts about this is that when you take away the government option uh, and you keep people from fighting over how, how, th how the private sphere is regulated in a sort of tribalistic type of warfare, uh, they start trying other methods uh, to come up with their own television, their own method of getting their, getting their voice out there. And so you start solving technology problems to create more networks, to create cable, to create Fox News, to create all these things that get your voice out there. So instead of trying to take over and make them listen to the conservative viewpoint or make them listen to some viewpoint, you start Fox News. And that's why private property still works better than politics, because you're, you're not guaranteed to win in politics, but in private property, you have a much better chance of getting your voice out there. The right side would like to weigh in here. Okay, I mean, now we're, okay. we're, we're going to shift now to the, to the right. Todd, take it. You know, I you know I, I think a couple of things. Uh, you know, we, we talk about values shifting and public perception shifting, and I think the the media uh, I, it has such a you know has such a power in that. And I want to use an example of, of Duck Dynasty. I, I'm a big fan of Duck Dynasty, and uh, I was I'm a fan of. I'm the only person in Brooklyn who you know every time I blow my duck call, all the liberals start marching down my street. Um, but uh, but people were genuinely shocked and surprised because if you look at the if you look at all the like the you know the the uh, the Hollywood talk shows, it's all about the Kardashians or the Real Housewives of whatever city, and they had nothing about the Duck Dynasty folks. And all of a sudden, when the ratings come out, and Duck Dynasty is the number one television show in the country, you know the the, the mainstream media uh, they're genuinely shocked. You know how did this happen? You know, and and what people don't understand is I I don't believe the mainstream media reflects the true values of the country as a whole, and we get the skewed perception of what they think the country is when in fact it is not as liberal as, as, as they perceive it to be. But uh, I wanted to, to mention something about Facebook, and, and I think here's the issue. We did, I did a little experiment. Uh, I, I started searching for some of these crazy groups and pages on Facebook, and there's some really terrible sites out there. Uh, and there's some that were disparaging Ann Romney and wishing her ill will. 
so I reported that. I wanted to see what would happen. So I filed a complaint against this particular you, group. You mean like the Kill Sarah Palin site That's right, that was kills, not taken right. down by Facebook? And it was not taken down because they said those pages did not violate their community standards. And yet, at the same time, uh, a page that speaks negatively about a policy from President Obama does violate their standards. And then I tried, there was a site that has something about killing Christians. And so I filed a complaint against that, uh, that, that page. And I got back the same response that, that that doesn't violate Facebook's community standards, but a page that promotes Christianity does violate their standards. It really doesn't make any sense. So, all right, so, so, so you'd be a good source of shaming, uh, <laughs> yeah. to go back to what Trevor and Adam are saying. In other words, it, it, the more these stories get out, I mean, hypocrisy is a powerful argument, particularly when hypocrisy deals with information, freedom of information, and, and important debates, you know, nationally on these issues. One of the, uh, I've been just thinking about um, analogies to where we find ourselves, and I, I agree with the other panelists. I don't want the government to be regulating these things. I, I, I you know, I'm an, a fan of the, uh, the Green family's decision not to provide uh, services to their employees in, in line with the ACA mandates um, because I believe they have a right to run their business according to their values and I think that that should apply as generally as possible. Um, uh, comma, but uh, to borrow from, from Paul, uh, you know, just because something is permissible doesn't make it wise. And as I've been thinking about analogies to where we find ourselves in these in these arenas, I'm thinking of American higher education, where some of these same arguments could be made. If Christians want to be involved in education, well, they can start their own colleges. And that's true, and indeed, we have. Um, but we all know that, that some universities exert much greater influence over, um, over culture than others do. And uh, we also know that universities that purport to be these laboratories of, of uh, freedom of expression and the free exchange of ideas and the, and the competition of ideas is, is, complete, uh, is complete fertilizer, as Tan would say. That um, if you don't abide by certain ideological lines, uh, you won't receive tenure, you won't receive a job, and as a student, your voice will be marginalized as being unacceptable. Um, that's, that's too bad. American higher education is worse off because of these norms. Um, though they may be perfectly legal, um, we as a society are worse off because um, that has become true. And I think the same is going to be true if we find ourselves in a position where uh, these social media utilities, uh, though they may be free to uh, bar certain voices, um, uh, choose to do so. It, it, it's to the detriment of all of us. I, on the university point, um, I think this is a, a fascinating point because I look at this from the I'm like a I'm not even, I'm a hundred thousand foot thinker. So I've I see I see that the federal government in general has been violating sort of useful barriers of so, of sovereignty, let's call them, but they're bigger than that. So they've been violating states' rights systematically, and they've been violating individual rights systematically. And the way they they're constantly getting into the private sphere and politicizing it and messing it all up. So the university is a really good example. It's very, I mean, it's very hard. How do you, you know, Liberty University <clears throat> and Hillsdale College, for example, the only way they can stay out of the government's jurisdiction is to accept no federal money, right? They had, they, and, and so uh, it, the, it is bad that the government has gotten so pervasive that they can take any hook and get inside your private life and start regulating it, including federal money. As soon as you take federal money, you gotta comply with every DOE regulation on, on sexual harassment and everything else. I think that's horrible, and I think it's been very anti-conservative, libertarian, and anti-religious in general, but I don't think we should be advocating piercing more veils with public with public uh, force in order to try and fix that, right? All right, so, so, so here's what I'm, I'm hearing. First of all, it's effective to shame these companies, and hypocrisy may be uh, a powerful argument. Second of all, we have to respect their private property rights, and, and clearly, I think we're all in agreement about that. We are believers in free enterprise. But what are the arguments, the techniques, the values, the, the schemes that we use to, to sharpen this argument? Because as we continue this debate, and, and NRB is going to continue this, uh, as we continue the debate, what is the point we need to be making to these companies? Because their response can be, uh, we're the geniuses that invented these platforms. If you don't like it, make your own. Uh, so let's talk for a minute about some of the instances of censorship that we showed in our current assessment document. Some of them are anti-religious. Some are anti-political speech. Some are censorship of journalists who are pro-Israel and anti-Palestinian authority. Which ones um, were your 
favorites as an example for a poster boy or girl to, to shame these companies as saying, really, really, you can say that you're, in the fa in case of Facebook, connecting the world together and yet you're doing this. You're Google and you're saying, as Carl Schultz uh, has said, uh, or Schmitz, excuse me, has said um, off and on public debates uh, that we're all about free speech. We want more speech, not less. Uh, really, and you do these kinds of, of shutdowns. Which ones were the ones that you find particularly pernicious as you looked at those examples, Todd? Well, I think the, you know the the issue for me, for me as a journalist, uh, when, when you're talking about pro-Israel, I think that really resonates with people. And you know, we when we are covering these stories in the media, we can't do a story every time someone is blocked on Facebook. So we have to be very uh, selective in the, in the in the stories that we cover. Uh, and uh, and really, um, I think that we need to step back and look at not just blaming Facebook, because they tell us that there are these algorithms that they use you know, when they go after these groups. And uh, many, in many cases, liberals, uh, people who are, you know, uh, for whatever reason, or have a political persuasion, will gang up, get together, and file multiple, multiple complaints against you know, these Facebook pages. Uh, and that leads to, to, the, to the blocking. So um, you know, I think that we need to take that into consideration as well. But I think for me, uh, especially when there are issues involving matters of faith, uh, pro-Israel groups, those are the ones that matter to me. Okay, uh, Eric, what about you? Yeah, ours. Ours is probably the uh, <laughs> the most pernicious. I'm also shocked, uh, but yeah, it's right, yeah. Um, no, but you were, that was the launch. No. I don't remember. Now I do remember Google had some controversy because it, there was Google China, and over in China. Uh, and th their defense was, and I think there is some basis for this, they said, look, we're in China, we have to obey the, the Chinese government, I mean, that's the law. And so as a result, Google cooperated in striking certain words, uh, some were religious, many of them were political, from their search engine saying, you know, these searches won't be allowed. And then, of course, they sort of apologized and they did pull out of China later on. Uh, perhaps because of public perception, or there may have been business reasons for that. But Eric, the, um, the, the, yeah, the, the thing about um, the Manhattan Declaration being barred under these supposed guidelines is is that it's just completely um, it, it's just completely uh, unwarranted given given the tone and, and content of the Manhattan Declaration itself. There's some truly ugly stuff out there related yeah. to homosexuality. In fact, selfishly, as someone who advocates for traditional marriage, um, I wish YouTube would ban the pastor in name that southern state who says these horribly ugly things um, in the name of God about creatures who were created in his image and whom he loves, who deserve to be treated with the full dignity deserving of every human being. That's what the Manhattan Declaration says. That's what we believe. So the idea that this is somehow hate speech is just completely ludicrous. And, 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 is, and, and therefore, us being banned is indicative of, of a real political bias that refuses to even consider for a moment that there might be a rational perspective not born out of animus um, that would lead someone to believe that marriage should be between a man and a woman. Adam, uh, if you were sitting down with one of these companies and they said, well, you know, were there so many instances where we kind of got it wrong in terms of viewpoint takedowns? Uh, are there exa what examples would you give them? I, they don't necessarily even have to be the ones that NRB has listed in their reports. Are there examples that you would be high on your concern list rather than others? Well, I, I've had to deal with some of these companies uh, facing uh, calls to take down certain types of anti-American speech and even pro-terrorist speech. I mean, that's... That's awful stuff, and some of it's calling for death of America, death to Americans, and all that kind of stuff. Do you leave that up? If you're a platform that tries to serve the globe, your, your customer base is not just here in the States, um, even if you are a, a U.S.-based company. I mean, how you deal with that is really difficult, especially when you have, like, certain senators on the phone saying, you need to take that stuff down right now. Um, and that's, you know, companies... Facebook, not just Facebook and well, Google. Amazon got calls like that about hosting certain types well, of content. Well, not, not to... But if they're gonna if they're gonna keep that up, that certainly means we can use that to put pressure on them to say, well, geez, religious free speech, <laughs> this is not nearly as controversial, right? right. right. If you're gonna keep up no anti-American right. hate, you know, geez, then you should be allowing these other things. So I, I think the principle of reciprocity and sort of equal treatment is the one that we want to press here, which is if you're gonna keep these sorts of things up, 
you should certainly keep others. Well, we remember when Benghazi <laughs> happened, and there was a temporary period of time where the official line from Washington, from the, the Obama administration, was that it was because of a video. In fact, I right. think, didn't that happen right before one of our, our uh, conferences yeah, here? Exactly right. Uh, and it had just happened. We, we were still sorting out the facts. As it turned out, the video really wasn't, I, th I don't think, the instigating factor. But the Obama administration did contact Google, I yep. believe, and suggest to them that this might violate their policies and maybe they the should take the... Now, were you con did, did that trouble you? It did trouble me. I mean, there, there you have a state actor in, in you know, the White House, no less, or people close to it, who are putting heavy pressure on a speech intermediary to potentially take content down. Hey, that's, that's censorship by a different name, right? It's at least indirect censorship, and, that, and that's the kind of thing that troubles me greatly. Now, to Google's credit, they said, we looked at our community guidelines. This does not appear to violate them. They consulted a lot of third party groups, which is something we should talk about, Craig, which is the yeah. role of third parties in terms of sort of like community advisory boards, things. This is something a lot of internet intermediaries are undertaking today for various purposes related to safety and privacy, which is bringing together outside experts to act as sort of a check or to provide sort of guidance. And to the extent the national religious broadcasters and other Christian groups can get on those bodies and influence them and say, we want to have a voice too, that could be huge. Uh, Dear Facebook, if you're out there, we're ready to be invited. We, we, we've, we've attempted to dialogue with all of these companies unsuccessfully in a number of different fora. It is interesting recently that a number of feminist groups in a feminist coalition uh, drew attention to Facebook about some anti-women postings on Facebook. Facebook welcomed them, said we're going to change our policies, please come in, uh, uh, you know, let's share wisdom and help us reform our guidelines. We'd like the same opportunity to talk about religious speech and other speech as well. So uh, I think that's a, a terrific idea. Uh, Trevor, now are there some examples that uh, I, I give you more pause than others about these viewpoint takedowns that you would, if you had a chance to talk to these companies, say, not a good idea. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm equally uh, disturbed by all the examples that have been listed here. I mean, they're, they're obviously ridiculous. Now, of course, they, they can make mistakes, and I think they've admitted to make mistakes, and yes, they have their own biases and, and all these things. Uh, and I expect them to make mistakes. And again, your ability to redress that is so much better with Facebook and, and Google and with organizations like, like NRB to make a fuss about it. Uh, I, I, I get concerned about <clears throat> other people who, who can't really make a fuss about it. That's what that's always one of my concerns. Uh, whenever you're, it, it, you know, you're a weird marginal person with strange beliefs, uh, and you can't make a fuss about it. About uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, maybe. And certainly not Cato. Right? <laughs> no, no, <so> <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah, whatever, whatever sort of you know person who doesn't have a, a group to support them yeah. uh, in in a variety of ways. Uh, I definitely think the China thing is is was disturbing. Uh, one of the problems that we're just generally railing against here, and, and again, this goes back to the question about uh, attitudes about same-sex marriage. You know, part of this is just generally railing, railing against uh, starting I mean, the public opinion changing in a way, and it may be unnatural. I, I completely agree that the media is pushing it in the way they want to do it. But sometimes marginalized people in, in who would have opinions that are not very popular, uh, you know, they, they're sort of written out by the market and they don't they don't have as much uh, ability to make their voice heard and uh, government usually doesn't solve that unfortunately uh, it makes it worse so. all right well let's, uh, we're going to change gears a little bit uh, and we're going to go on a fascinating issue about something i read a number of years ago about google's plan and perhaps that they're effectuating and i don't know uh, to develop an algorithm where they would be able to spot thing, uh, content on their sites that would have a high index of being fraudulent or misleading or inaccurate. Uh, now let's assume that that's possible. Uh, good idea or bad idea for these platforms, all of them or any of them, to say we're going to flag, so, and, and again we're not talking about legal regulations or the law, we're talking about just what would be good policy or bad policy if we had these folks sitting around a table with us. Good idea or bad idea? Well, I think, I think that's a crazy idea. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, uh, these folks can't even figure out how to celebrate Christmas with their Google little uh, Google thingy. So, uh, yeah, bad idea. Okay. Eric, what do you think? Um, so can you um, explain to me a little bit yeah, more yeah. What, well, you're, what it is you're talking For about. instance, there's a whole lot of, and I, for, I encountered this when I had the opportunity. There's misinformation on the internet. Yeah, misinformation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. everyone. Well, well, and, and there, are, there are journalists and, and, and media pundits in Washington that have really been concerned about the decline of journalism since the internet started because internet journalism supposedly has less uh, uh, 
uh, co uh, collegiality professionally in terms of you know being mentored and sponsored and reviewed and monitored by professional journalists so people can say anything they want to when urban myths get spread and sometimes that information there's been some reports on Twitter during political campaigns where one bit of misinformation deliberately planted can change the course of an entire political campaign so let's assume G Google or others say we have figured out a way to flag stuff that's suspected to be very quickly, by the way, mechanically, uh, very quickly tag something as probably false. And so let's put, let's assume they can put a flag on information. They can say, this is probably false. This is probably an urban myth. This is probably not reliable information. Suppose they could do that, or at least from an engineering standpoint, they could tell us that they've done that. Good idea or bad idea? Oh, yeah, that's a terrific idea. That's <laughs> right. really well. Well, no, let's assume, yeah. let, well, yeah, well, let's assume, I, let's assume that moronic. they could show. Why would they even want to do that? So assume that's they could show like a 75 to 80 percent accuracy rate in further reflection on on the things they flagged as urban myth, inaccurate, so, and unreliable. Uh, okay, so I wrote a Forbes column about this uh, last year called "Do We Need a Ministry of Truth for the Internet?" I think you can imagine what my answer is. <laughs> Um, but the point is, is that there had been some rumblings in academia about the need for so-called algorithmic auditing, the need for some sort of independent check on the ability of online intermediaries to provide truthful information to the masses. If we're really going to rely on the Googles and the, and, the, and the Facebooks and the Microsofts and the Twitters of the world to provide information to us, then we sure, certainly should hope that the information we see the most is, is accurate. Now, of course, this is an extraordinarily controversial thing, but the particular author in this case was Evgeny Morozov, who wrote a slate piece advocating something like this to try to counter uh, various types of uh, matters where there is scientific consensus um, on various issues, and use the example of vaccinations and global warming. And these, you know, there's a lot of controversy about vaccinations and global warming, as you can imagine, but he suggested that there was si enough scientific consensus that perhaps some body, and he was very unclear on who that some body should be, would be there sort of providing a check and then would help Google flag results that were sort of anti-vaccination or that were, you know, uh, suspicious of global warming theories. Now. This gets right back to our discussion about private intermediaries and you know how they police themselves. Google's search results are organic. They come about because of sort of what the masses generally click on the most. Um, they're not sort of uh, put together and uh, on a daily basis and said, well, this is what we think is best. Now, they can go in and affect that, but they don't. Uh, but let me qualify that. You, you can buy your presence on those Google search priorities, can't you? Yeah, but it says ad. Yeah, that's an ad. It's an ad. Well, let me, tells you uh, then let, me, let, me, let me tell you a phenomenon that I found to be utterly amazing. Al Jazeera just launched its national television platform, and, and, and they've got brilliantly decide, uh, designed ads, and their marketing campaign is equally brilliant. And when they came out, I decided to check Google on uh, Google News. Google News on Al Jazeera. For the first, I think, three pages of Google, they were all Al Jazeera.com sites. And you had to go four pages in to see any criticisms of Al Jazeera in actual news stories. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure how that happened, but I have a theory. Wow. But so, so I get, get to my point about buying your way in or, or establishing artificially your, your hierarchy. So, so hey, Craig, if you, uh, and if you Google me, it'll be, uh, seriously, if you Google me, the, the first results are from, you know, liberal websites that hate my guts, <laughs> you know, for, for whatever reason. Yeah. I, but that's because I, a lot of the, probably people have <laughs> Click on that. Right? Right? Which I mean, is true. You need more friends, Todd. <laughs> Then you'll get up there higher on the, but can on I, the Google can I, list. Can I throw the, I want to throw yeah. this out there. Uh, just this past week, something happened where uh, one of these fake conservative news sites, and if you go to the website, it looks just like a regular news site, but it is phony as a, you know, as a $3 bill or whatever. And uh, they announced that President Obama was declaring, I think, November Muslim Appreciation Month. And I can't tell you how many how many shares or emails I got from people saying, Todd, have you heard about what President Obama's doing? All that to say, I think there's a great responsibility on the part of the consumer, the news consumer, uh, to, to make sure that they're getting their information from mm -hmm. a reliable source. And I would, I would really um, shudder to think that, that Google would want to take that responsibility of, of flagging what is and what is not uh, real news. But I think that the, the, the re there is a responsibility at the point of the consumer. You know, are you going to read, um, you know, are you going to watch Fox News or, you know, one of these, uh, you know. Yeah. No, I want to greatly second that and add in that, that um, 
people are still figuring out the internet. We may we may yeah. think that that's not the case, but they actually still are to some extent. And it takes a little bit of time. It hasn't been as pervasive. It's only been you know, as pervasive for about 15 years. You know, and maybe 10 years ago, no, maybe five years ago, I used to get a couple forwards from my dad you know, a week uh, telling me about some crazy thing. And every single time he'd forward me one of them, I'd forward him back at the Snopes link. You know, <laughs> and being like, no, dad, this is not true. And then eventually he learned that himself. And, so, and then he also emailed other people. This is part of the evolving standards of the internet that you figure out who's trustworthy and who's not. Now, Google putting themselves in that position, I, I think they're free to try. I think that they will upset a lot of people in their consumer base who, who, if they think Google is filtering stuff so they don't have the choice to go check through their avenue. These, this is where free speech regulation, uh, and, and, and this is still private, but again, if, if the government wants to get involved and the, and the left uh, uh, always is into that, uh, Ministry of Truth, this is where it's really, di uh, really dangerous because there's a few things more gratifying than thinking that the reason people disagree with you is because they've been duped by a bunch of sources of misinformation. And therefore, it's a public service to make people agree with you. That is usually, so, and this is something that happens in campaign finance le le law all the time. That you, uh, Coming you know, up for argument next week, by the way. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it's this happens in campaign board. finance, where and you see that the real reason for this is that they think that if, if the playing field was level, they would win the debate. That, and, then, and, and that's sort of the substantive aim. And I think this is something we all always have to think about. Uh, it's you know, the most psychologically difficult thing to believe or the reason people disagree with you is because you're not as convincing as you think you are, which is probably true. <laughs> the most psychologically gratifying thing to think is that because Fox News is out there and all these people, they're just, they're just distorting the truth and we need a government agency. And, and it's the same issue in some basic senses of this panel today. You know, how effectively can we pierce the private sphere? Are they better at individual? individuals are doing this? Do we want the government involved in this at all? And of course, no. Well, yes. it, Trevor, you made a great point about the internet. You know, we all assume it's been around for a long time. Just to show you how perception about the, reali the, the, the reliability and, and utility of the internet and internet-based uh, platforms, how, how recent this is, there was a case, federal case, in the late 1990s, I think it may have been 1999, uh, from, by a federal judge in uh, Texas, and I'm not disparaging this great state of Texas, or the Republic of Texas, as they call it down there, <laughs> but the judge, uh, an advocate, an attorney said, well, Your Honor, um, if you, you go on the internet, you'll leave, find this blah, blah fact to be true. The judge said, wait, hold it. You said, look at the internet? The advocate said, yes, it's right there. And he says, I'll tell you why I'm not gonna listen to your argument, because everything on the internet is voodoo information. <laughs> Somehow the operation of this thing you can't see, touch, hear, or feel is un so unreliable it is voodoo. Now, there may still be some voodoo stuff in terms of content, but the operation of the internet, I think we now understand, is still developing. Yeah, and it's always interesting, too, because I just noticed this myself. You, you look at a website, and you, you actually screen things very quickly. You say, well, that ad, ad is clearly being placed there. To, like, this is a Google ad. It's placed up there. You do it very quickly, and you adapt to you see what they're trying to get you to click on. And, and you, 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 fig, you adjust your behavior to knowing where the misinformation lies. All right, let me ask a quick question. I want to ask this of all four panelists. All of these companies, and many, many others, you know, Apple, Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, uh, and other new media companies, they all have these policies that ban hate speech. They say, we will take you down if we denominate it to be hate speech. Just need a quick yes or no. You can elaborate a little bit. We're running short on time. Good idea or bad idea from a policy, from their written policy standpoint. Todd, do you have some feelings on that? Well, I'm a, I believe in free speech, and I think companies have a right to, to set those policies. Uh, you know, but um, yeah, so, so I think that would be my opinion there. Okay, Eric? Yeah, I agree too, um, so long as they're um, objective and fair and, and uniformly applied. Okay. Yes, yeah. they have to have some policies regarding hate speech because there are actually some very hateful activities and actors that uh, exist in these environments and they have to deal with things that are legitimately harassing. I hope they don't read those policies too broadly to include legitimate forms of speech. You'd agree, though, that they have in the past used hate speech regulations as an excuse to too just, clo just close down viewpoints they don't want. Yeah, I think no. that's a problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I mean, there's, a, there's always the possibility of liability, too. I mean, there's different shield laws and different protections out there, but, you know, lawyers you know, like to come up with new arguments for how to get to the deepest pockets. And if they're seen to be facilitating or allowing something that maybe ends in a, in a murder that's considered a hate murder, they're concerned about that because they're legally gun shy. So that's the other concern. All right. As I said, we're running short on time, so I really want to 
pose a general question to all of you to kind of uh, wax philosophical for a moment on this. And the, and the question is this, where do we go from here? Now, of course, one of the solutions that has been suggested here is the more diversity we have in internet platforms, the more they have less of a hold or a monopoly on information channels, and therefore we have more opportunities for more speech, and more speech is always better than less speech. That's, that's certainly good in the abstract. I don't know what the possibilities are, and I'll, I'll mention one situation that happened. Um, there was some, an anti Christian site that was started, I think it was something to the effect that uh, the, the name of the Facebook site was uh, Mary Should Have Aborted, and it was obviously an anti-Christian pro-abortion all in one, so you have to, I guess, give them ingenuity, kudos for that. Uh, they were the all in one fell swoop. Uh, Christians were outraged and told Facebook take it down. I think Facebook considered taking it down anyway. They decided to keep it up. So the group said, okay, well, we're going to start our own site. Uh, the success of alternates to uh, alternatives to Facebook, at least right now, look highly unlikely. Um, but that's a possibility. It's a possible remedy for this. Uh, what do you think, number one, about encouraging these companies to think creatively about alternatives to take down? For instance, rather than take down speech you don't like, have a little red flag saying, this is disgusting, signed Facebook. But we're leaving it up because we believe in free speech. Or alternatives to take, creative alternatives to take down. Good idea or bad idea? Well, I think that's a bad idea um, because I don't want Facebook to put something nasty on my page. Um, but but I, I do think that you raise a very good point about these alternative groups. And last year, the Tea Party community launched uh, their own Facebook page. They have about 100,000 members. But it's really not going to reach the size and the magnitude of Facebook. I just think Facebook needs to let people do what they want to do on their pages. And we have the right to read or not read those pages. Mm. Um, I think that Facebook and uh, and other sites should be really careful. Um, you know, I remember when Facebook started. I was in college. I was a senior in college when, when we finally got Facebook back when it was campus by campus. Um, I also remember Zanga. I remember MySpace. I remember uh, a whole slew of other attempts at social networking um, that have come and gone. And uh, Facebook's day is going to come too, and it's going to come faster if um, they come to be understood to be um, ideologically oriented and, and to fail to live up to um, the current perception of Facebook, Facebook, which is a social community where people get to exchange um, ideas and opinions and, uh, and stupid pictures of cats and stuff. <laughs> Adam, uh, suggestions for where we go from here? Yeah, well, first of all, um, I, I want to reiterate that point about don't ever give up on the idea of alternative platforms and more competition. My, my favorite piece that I quote in all my work on uh, the question of like social media power and Facebook and Google in particular is this piece from 2007 in The Guardian uh, by Victor Keegan called Will MySpace Ever Lose Its Monopoly? <laughs> 2007. We didn't think it was possible. And we're saying the same thing about Facebook now, and it, it's a firm that didn't exist 10 years ago, right? I mean, 10 years ago, we were still having an antitrust case against Microsoft, and Google was starting to kick its butt then. Things change quickly in our modern digital economy. But to go back to your point, Craig, what do we do in the meantime with the companies that do have large platforms and a lot of power? Well, counter speech is always the first best alternative and encouraging them to give the community more and better ways to get their views out there in an uncensored fashion is the way to go. So that general principle that I know has been in the Milton Project documents and everything you've been advocating, Craig, is exactly the first best right approach that we should be pushing them to is give us a chance to speak. If you give these people a chance, give us a chance. Reciprocity, fair treatment is the okay. principle. Trevor? Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. Um, I, uh, there are other possibilities of you know whether a flag would work, and this is consumer driven to, driven to some extent, which is fine. Uh, MySpace, uh, Facebook change with consumer driven, but again. Uh, what happens when something becomes this pervasive? So we already had, and I'm sure Adam knows more about this, I'm sure, than I do, uh, certain leftists writing about uh, regulating Facebook as a public utility fairly recently, right? And they were trying to do that for many of the same concerns. I mean, I know you're not, that's not what, but but it's not off the table in, in the John Milton's projects, like, like so, right? The first thing is voluntary. Um, so yes, everyone wants to regulate the, them as public utilities to make sure that they comply with what they think they sh is good for the public. Um, let them compete, let them uh, create different uh, policies and procedures, and we'll see which one wins out. And Facebook is definitely not etched in stone. Well, at this point, first of all, uh, let's give a, a rounding uh, 
uh, applause for uh, our panelists and the information that they've given us today and the ideas. Um, we're not going to go into, into a Q&A, and I'm going to turn the podium over to our uh, associate legal counsel, uh, Jennifer uh, Gregorin, who, by the way, has been uh, a stalwart assistant to me in setting up not only this event, but a lot of the research that went into uh, the current assessment report. She's been an invaluable asset, and I want to thank her publicly for that. She's going to, first of all, turn this over to press and then to attendees other than press for questions to any of the panelists or to myself uh, in terms of the issues that we've talked about today. Like Craig said, we'll open it to the press first, then to the rest of our guests. Um, if you can just state your name and also what organization you're with. Yes. I'm Catherine Bruce with the University of Minnesota, and my question for anyone on the panel. You talked a lot about um, featuring like Christian speech or you wear political conservative speech, and I'm wondering about um, whether or not you stand with the purpose of not intimidating this group, for example, like Muslim organizations who don't have books in libraries or anything like that. How do you stand with anything you say about that? The, the question, and just because there's no mic in the audience, the question is whether there has, whether we've seen censorship of groups that are not Christian, so for example, Muslims, so non-Christian, non-conservative speech. Religious groups that are non-Christian. Todd. Not to my knowledge. Um, the Council on American Islamic Relations uh, keeps, keeps track on, you know, uh, attacks on, on the Islamic faith. And to my knowledge, I have not seen them provide any instances of that. Uh, but uh, it seems as though most of the attacks have been predominantly on Christian, on Christian organizations, evangelical Christian organizations. Now, if, if, if I could ask, because I think your question is uh, shutdowns by these new media companies against that speech as opposed to a uh, attacks allowed on certain foras against religion. For instance, uh, there's a great deal of anti-Semitic content on certain sites, uh, but you're not talking about uh, user content criticizing religion. You're talking about the companies closing down Correct. religious viewpoints. Okay, thank you. Right. And have Craig, have you or any of the other panelists seen any of that? Uh, there, I mean, I go back to the point I made earlier about there have been suggestions by certain policymakers and third-party groups that certain uh, Islamic sites on social net networks are engaging in terrorist uh, discussions or activities. I mean, you know, it's an eye of the beholder thing, right? I mean, when they advocate certain views about this world that we don't agree with, is that legitimate speech or not? Um, and so is that religious speech or not? I mean, or is it a threat? Or, or, or is it a threat, or? right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So there have been instances of takedown related to those matters many of which have been driven by not necessarily a legal requirement, but just a heavy hand from somebody in government saying you should do this. Uh, for example, uh, so when Senator Lieberman was uh, still in the Senate, he very actively pushed Google uh, through its blogger platform to remove certain types of uh, sites related to uh, pro-Islamic, what he regarded as terrorism activities. He also called Amazon and requested it take down certain things uh, at certain times, although I, that might have been more WikiLeaks related. Um, but the point is that there, there have been efforts more indirect on things like that. And there have been instances, by the way, we, in our research, we weren't just looking for Christian uh, takedowns, anti-Christian uh, animus, but that's what, we, that's what we found. There have been instances, to their credit, where Facebook uh, and Google and others have taken down true threats um, uh, for, you know, jihadist uprisings and things like this, calls for violence, and those takedowns from the standpoint of the John Milton Project, we believe if we were sitting across the table helping these companies fashion their policies, the reason we think the First Amendment is a great place to start is because true threats and, and attempts to uh, intimidate through threats of violence is an area where the Supreme Court says the First Amendment stops and protection of individual safety begins. Yeah, but that, that's interesting though because that would have a Facebook um, and Google have a, a 
less standard than the First Amendment generally gives because threats that are very, that don't create imminent harm, that possibly imminent harm, are protected by the First Amendment. I mean, the KKK case with, you know, a two day break and that was protected. So, so that would put them, that's their, they would be applying a higher standard of the First Amendment, um, probably for liability purposes and nothing else. Well, and, and that's a great point, Trevor. We want to get back to our Q&A. But I've often thought that if, if I was sitting across the table from these companies helping them with their policies, I'd say, you know, you can adjust to the reality of the Internet, the First Amendment Supreme Court decisions. And in this case, in terms of threats of violence, the word imminent, which is the imminent uh, occurrence of violence, which is a component of the First Amendment applied to government restraint, I think needs to be relaxed when it's the internet because the internet is imminent globally, spontaneously. So you need to say everything is imminent, therefore everything would be shut down. So my suggestion would be anything that you deem to be a true threat calling for violence, uh, actual violence, doesn't need to meet the imminence standard. Uh, that we apply to government censorship. Yeah, but we, we, we'll, we probably have yet to see that case. Maybe the Supreme right. Court will agree. Like, if the Facebook page says, "Let's blow up the, let's blow up Congress," you know, and like, and meet me there, you know, on August, on August twenty third, twenty fourteen. Let's all blow up Congress. Well, it's not very imminent, but they might agree to take it down. You know, this the violation for Cat Catherine. I think this is a really <laughs> interesting question, and and it, it reminded me of an, uh, a fascinating phrase in in your report here, mm -hmm. Craig. Um, about Facebook taking down content that expresses, quote, politically religious agendas. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm no expert on world religions, um, but I, I believe that there are religions whose um, theological tenets don't include the sort of public witness, the sort of ethics that the Christian religion calls its, its believers to. And so um, the lack of situations where a social media site like Facebook would have um, shut down a, a non-Christian religious group um, may be indicative of a certain bias towards Christianity, or it may be that um, uh, Christianity is uh, the foremost religion, certainly in the United States, where um, the, the religion necessarily has political ramifications for the people who follow it, and that it's those political ramifications that the folks at Facebook really dislike, not because they assume that you could be a Christian and, and not have a, a sort of a political ethic that would come from that, which, which I would argue is wrong. More from the press. Yes. The question is the level of engagement that NRB has had with any of the companies that we've been talking about. Uh, it's a great question, Jonathan. We have reached out in a variety of different forms to all of the companies that we've mentioned today. Uh, we have had minimal success. I mentioned conversations with Facebook. Uh, that was one limited telephone co uh, contact, a rather lengthy conversation about the difficulties Facebook faces with the numbers of complaints that they have and the fact they're doing the best that they can. But there has not been uh, a receptivity to a dialogue, about a real dialogue, about how they can fashion their policies to be more free speech friendly and also their practices and how they might better educate their monitors because they have uh, large numbers of staff people who have to take their policies, look at a complaint, and then make a decision and push the button or not push the button. Uh, so we've had... Uh, limited meetings, telephone conversations, and letters uh, exchanged with these companies and with real, n n almost no success in having them understand what I believe to be the seriousness of the free speech value aspect of uh, what we're talking about. That's the same question to the other panelists. Um, Facebook, you know, it was very difficult uh, if, if you're trying to get a hold of someone at Facebook. Uh, it's sort of like a maze trying to find, you know, emails or telephone numbers. Um, I think at, at, the, at the network level, some of the larger organizations have those direct contacts, you know, have that direct contact. Without that direct content or contact, I probably wouldn't have had my site uh, restored as quickly as, as it was. 
so, um, but again, no explanations, you know, no, uh, so there's really no understanding of what exactly I did to violate uh, their, their community standards. And my understanding is that uh, we had no communication with, with Apple at all. In general, yes, sir. You said we have no one. Uh, Robert Shred is over there in the front desk, sir. Um, two quick questions. One, uh, the subject of the algorithmic fraudulence that was brought up, and, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is something that you seem to at least for your first reaction you know, agree with that. But you could imagine. The first part of that, when speaking about Supreme Court cases that specifically with pornography have dealt with local community standards, so then how do we then apply that to the broad context of the internet? Catherine. Uh, it's, it, yeah, that, that, that still good law, technically, I, I guess. Uh, obscenity cases are pretty rare now, and the court is really, really... Uh, they're, they're, I mean, we have the Crush videos case, uh, Stevens. They're, they're not very, fr they're, they're very good on free speech, in, in my opinion, right now. So, uh, if that comes up again with the difference between, you know, Enid, Oklahoma, and New York City for for obscenity cases, uh, we'll see. I think that the the standard will change in that, just because the interconnectedness of 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 everything is is. Uh, I don't think that no, it has not it had that that specific thing has not been tested again. I think they mentioned Stevens maybe. Well, actually, yeah. it, it indirectly through modern cases involving both broadcasting on one hand and the internet on the other, the question of community standards has come up. Um, it's in serious dispute right yeah. now for mm -hmm. the traditional broadcast platforms um, as people start to have more of a national sort of attention span or, or interest set. But for the internet, basically, the courts have said, look, this just doesn't work when you've got a global platform. And the, your community is the entire community of the planet. So something has to give. And as everything converges, we live in a world of technological convergence, and everything's coming together, uh, the traditional notion of community standards as applied to First Amendment issues is just not going to work. Or it's going to give way to the idea that when the whole world's the platform, you've got to take that into account. You can't have a local standard governing everybody. It's interesting, in the Ashcroft case, and we filed an amicus brief with the Supreme Court in support of indecency regulations by the FCC. Um, we cited the Ashcroft case because in that case, the Supreme Court uh, affirmed uh, a statute, uh, an obscenity statute that, you know, kept continued the, the practice of citing favorably uh, community standards result. Now again, then we transpose that to the internet. It's interesting that Facebook calls their content policies community. 
Mm -hmm. they, they're community standards. But they're viewing it as the internet community, which is a global, uh, non-geographical cyberspace. Um, so they're thinking globally. Uh, so I do agree with Trevor and Adam that um, while we don't know what's going to happen to broadcast, and remember broadcast is different than the internet because the justification for regulating broadcasters and stations was that there's a scarcity of frequency and that therefore it has to be a resource that gets portioned out by the government with licenses. But of course they're all going to go to now as well. Right. And in fact, interestingly, the FCC, against our arguments, because we took a position against this, has required every television broadcaster now to put all their political files, meaning who they dialogue with, who wants a political ad, even if they don't place the ad, all of those files have to be placed on the internet now, including names, addresses, and so forth, which we didn't think was a terribly good idea. But you're right, there's a great deal of interface now. Every media platform now has an internet platform as well. Let me just clarify, I apologize, I was being sarcastic. I, I think the idea that... Oh, I'm, that I'm a little slow. No, yeah, <laughs> the idea that uh, all search results are equal, but some are more equal than others is, uh, is really a bad one, yeah. Where do we draw the line with hate speech? Uh, so I, I don't believe in hate speech as a First Amendment doctrine. Uh, I think it's offensive to the First Amendment, despite the rest of the world's love affair with hate speech regulation. Uh, as terms of a private doctrine, uh, that should be c confined to the company's sense of, of propriety and liability based on its customers, I would say. Um, I think they should err on the side of allowing speech. I don't think saying, you know, Muslims are among us and they, they hate us is would qualify as a, an actual threat of violence or an imminent threat of violence. It should be something pretty discreet that they take down for both fear of offending the majority of their customers and uh, having possible liability if something arises from it. This issue is, is one of the most vexing for all social media platforms, not just the bigger one, biggest ones, but the small ones as well. There are easy categories of hate speech, and then there are the incredibly controversial and uh, contentious ones. The easy ones are true and direct threats that would basically silence individuals from even being a part of that community. If you uh, persistently are hammering someone and saying, uh, if you come back to the site and say another word, I am going to find you and kill you, that's very hateful, and it's a direct and true threat. That sort of thing, obviously, almost any, every site has some policies against that. On the opposite extreme are things like, I just hate all these people, referring to whatever group you want. And this gets back to the point about what uh, Representative King said. I mean, it, I don't think it was very tasteful, and I'm, I'm troubled by it myself, but the reality is is that that's the sort of speech that, even if some consider it hateful, probably should stand. But it's an eye of the beholder problem. Every site is going to treat this issue a little differently. Um, some are going to be far more tolerant than others, and there'll be an online uh, free-for-all. Um, others are going to be very, very restrictive. And again, I'm a believer in letting a thousand flowers bloom, having the most permissive environments possible, so long as the direct and true threats aren't there that would silence everybody's speech. I, I, all of that sounds right to me. It's very complicated. I, I would just add that I think um, expressing an opinion that President Obama held until the spring of 2012 mm -hmm. it's probably means that it's not hate speech. <laughs> right side concurs with my fellow panelists. <laughs> Not. This is not a tragic individual, but a difference of opinion. So 
I guess I sort of my question would be like to you. Do you worry about controlling the free market and sounding like and sounding like another protected person here in America? The yeah. question is whether Christians would be accused of complaining too much and whether we would then sound like a, another minority. Yeah, um, that's a great point and, and a beautiful quote, and, and I agree. I agree entirely. I, I do think that um, we have to we have to be careful for a number of reasons about claims of persecution. You know, um, uh, uh, dozens of Christians were murdered in the past two weeks around the world, um, from from Kenya to to Pakistan. Um, that's that's persecution. Uh, being barred from Facebook is not persecution. That doesn't make it right. Um, obviously, but it's not persecution. So there's an extent to which we, we ought to um, uh, uh, advocate for um, uh, participation in the public square, absolutely. Um, but we do that because we believe that we have something to offer that is good, that others can benefit from. And uh, that's our motivation. Um, and so I think we need to fight, as, as Chuck often said, um, with uh, a, a spirit of, of joy and, uh, and keeping in mind our, our priorities, which are to communicate the, the love and truth and grace of God to those around us. Um, in, the, in a climate that uh, is increasingly hostile to um, uh, Christians uh, as it relates to religious freedom, um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's even more complicated because when, when Christians were in the majority, when America was sort of a, a de facto nominal Christian country, um, we didn't always respect the, the rights of others. We didn't always um, use our power responsibly. And now we're in the position where we have to ask for mercy from those uh, that we didn't always treat so mercifully. And um, um, I'm not sure that we should expect it all the time. Um, uh, that's not to say it's right. It's not to say that we deserve it. Um, but there's an extent to which we didn't always live up to the standards that we're now um, asking for, for the nation to abide by. I was struck by something that you said, Adam, when you were talking about these platforms are only 10 years old or less than 10 years old. And I kept on talking to Ben Nathan at MIT, and he seemed to be talking about um, how uh, evangelical broadcasters were confronted with a ban on the purchase of any kind of free religion network. And, and so they gathered together, and they formed uh, the National League of Broadcasters and spoke with one voice to the injustice of it. And I was wondering how that resolved itself, and it resolved itself with the formation of the new network, ABC, that reversed the ban, and the other networks followed suit. And then there was a, uh, a, a rising um, number of radio stations across the country that specialized in, in promoting the back and forth of the message Christianly in that sense. And so I thought it, it, it resolved itself without a governmental solution, but with the new formation of alternate uh, voices that kind of changed the arguments into following suit and on a more moral freedom basis. So I, I thank you for the reminder that we're dealing with something new on a platform and that there may be other experiences. Okay. Any more questions from the remainder? Yes. question is whether ISPs, whether we're looking at those as well for censorship. I think that in the, um, in one of your documents, you discussed the bit torn, uh, the torrenting uh, crackdown from Comcast, which I think is, I mean, it's one of these things, if you're applying First Amendment principles to it, you would say it was a, a neutral policy that had possible discriminatory effect if you couldn't download the King James Bible. I don't think that, that uh, it would be classified as discrimination. I think that's just a business practices idea. We saw what happened when they did throttle torrents. Everyone got super mad. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, I'm not aware of any other examples that would involve uh, religious speech or concerns regarding ISP direct efforts. And there really haven't been that many efforts that people can cite of ISPs attempting to interfere with traffic in the ways that people are concerned with. Uh, I, in fact, I find it kind of ironic that our primary concern here and with uh, the, the concern of the Milton Project involves social media intermediaries and not ISPs. 
because for the most part, this debate that's been going on about intermediary policing of speech, private intermediaries uh, trying to censor speech, has almost always been about the larger conduits and the ISPs, the telcos, the cable companies. So um, I think that's an interesting thing to note um, is that we don't really have very many examples uh, on the ISP side of things. But I think that's also because there are so many more social media intermediaries and platforms and obviously there, we will find more examples there as those grows, grow, grow larger. That's a very good question you raise, and uh, I covered the story of one military, um, one member of the military who uh, was punished, found himself in trouble because uh, his superiors actually went back and scrubbed his Facebook pages. They went back and read his postings, and they found that he had postings that supported uh, the traditional definition of marriage, and as a result, uh, he found himself uh, at odds with his, his superiors. So it is a, um, it's becoming a very difficult uh, time in this country for people of the Christian faith to publicly express their opinions about certain issues. And I think that's sad. Uh, I, am, uh, I am an evangelical Christian. I, I was uh, baptized uh, in a Southern Baptist church. I'm a pretty conservative guy. But I love the First Amendment, and I love the, the free exchange of all ideas, uh, ones that I disagree with. And I just find it very troubling that we live in a time in this country now where uh, views that I hold dear, and I think that many of you in this room cherish, um, we're going to find ourselves in big trouble one day because we hold, the, hold on to those beliefs. You're, you're very right. It's a troubling time. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, don't forget there are refreshments, and you can be sure that the National Religious Broadcasters, the John Milton Project, will continue to work on issues like this, and we hope that you follow along as we continue to, to uh, you know, bring out more reports and just are interested in this very, very relevant area at this time. So thank you for being here, and thank you again to our panelists. We appreciate them being here. Great stuff. Thank you.